So welcome to uh, our monthly uh, seminar series of our uh, Center for Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research in uh, Genetics. Uh, let me uh, give you a, a quick uh, coming attractions for our next uh, talk, which will be on February 24th. Uh, Monday, February 24th, Ken Kendler, who is one of the leading psychiatric geneticists uh, in the country, uh, will be here from Virginia Commonwealth uh, University, and we will be getting, very shortly, we'll be getting uh, notices out about uh, Ken's talk and his um, topic uh, for, uh, for that talk, and we're, we're uh, very pleased that he's going to be joining us. Um, but we're also very pleased today to have Jim Evans as our uh, guest. He's uh, been meeting with uh, a number of us during the course of the day, and it's been great to uh, have him here. Uh, Jim is uh, the Bryson Distinguished Professor of Genetics and Medicine uh, at the University of North Carolina at uh, Chapel Hill, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Genetics in Medicine uh, on the board of the American College of uh, medical genetics and genomics, and uh, one of the leading figures in uh, American uh, clinical genetics uh, today. Uh, he is uh, going to, uh, I think, provoke us, I hope, provoke us a little bit okay. today uh, with uh, his uh, thoughts on a, a new approach to public health uh, genomics. So Jim, thank Great. you so much. All right. So it's, it's really nice that it's a, a small group here. So please interrupt me if I do provoke you. Um, please interrupt, and uh, I think we'll be able to get through the slides. And even if we don't, I'd rather have a discussion. So um, you know, I, I, one of the things I like thinking about is how technology plays into um, various social phenomenon, but especially in the sense of, of um, medicine and practicality of, of technologies. And I think it's really instructive if you think back on a couple of, of um, very important, oh, that's right, okay, uh, very important technologies. Um, one is, is this, um, this was the first x-ray ever taken, um, that's William Rentkin's wife's hand, you can see her wedding ring there. Um, and it, it really didn't take any particular insight to, to figure out how that would be used in a practical sense. The, the world literally beat a path to um, the door of the Rentkins. Um, and within a year, it was being used to diagnose fractures and et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, electricity, well, electricity had been known about since the ancients, right? The Greeks described static electricity. Um, and as late as the late 18th century, Benjamin Franklin, who was much more famous as a, as a, a scientist before he was famous as a statesman, um, said, you know, electricity is a really interesting phenomenon, but it will never be of any practical importance. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. And, and then taking that analogy, so, so when it comes to genomics, I think we are Somewhere in the middle there, I think we can all see some utility of it, but I think it's unclear precisely how it will play out. Um, and, and taking that analogy a little bit further, it's also interesting to me how crazy claims are made, right? So when electricity became, started to be useful and we could generate it and we could experiment with it, there were all of these health claims for it, right? Same with radioactivity. And, and uh, many of them, let's just say like, the electric corset did not uh, did not really materialize as something something useful. So so where will genomics actually prove useful, and where um, is the is the real promise of it? And I think that's worth thinking about. And it's not an idle question because if we get that wrong, and if we drink the Kool Aid, and we we embrace the wrong things, we we can actually do harm, right? And if we on the other hand, if we miss the real opportunities. Um, we've, we've missed um, chances there where we could have helped people. So any technology, I'll try to I'll talk to you guys too. Uh, any technology um, can, I think, justifiably be derided by the old, the old saw, 
no pun intended, that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And God knows we have just beat the hell out of everything with massively parallel sequencing in the last 10 years, as I would argue we should in a research setting. I mean, I, you know, it may be a fishing expedition, but you catch fish with a fishing expedition. So sequencing the hell out of this bacteria and that bacteria and marsupials and placental mammals, or they, we learn tremendous amounts. But in medicine, we, we can't afford to be quite as non undiscriminatory, right? And I think what we have to ask is, what are the right nails for this very powerful, powerful tool? Because even a hammer, right, while it is a blunt instrument, is a very effective instrument if you, if you apply it correctly. So, you know, I, the, the question then is, what are the appropriate tools, or the appropriate nails for this, this powerful hammer? in both sick people and healthy people, right? And, and I think it's become pretty obvious, it was obvious really from the start to most people, that, that uh, diagnosis will be a major application of massively parallel sequencing. Um, and I, I think, though, that what is often missed when people talk about that is in what kind of disorders it will be useful. I would submit to you that doing whole genome sequencing on somebody with type 2 diabetes or with um, you know, heart disease is not going to, in most cases, prove to be of any value whatsoever to that person. Um, it's rather going to be in those cases where a condition is primarily genetic. And, and making a diagnosis, it remains a big deal. It remains a very important thing that we do in medicine. And I would argue that it really is the linchpin of medicine. It can guide prognosis, treatment, and, and really importantly, it enables medical progress, right? If we can characterize things and understand them at a fundamental level, we, we then know what you know, the next steps are. And it, it also can provide tangible benefits. Sometimes, as I'll show you in one case, it can guide effective treatment. Um, sometimes it, it can be preventive and, and afford uh, preventive modalities. Um, it can oftentimes inform reproductive decisions if you're in a situation where you can take advantage of those reproductive decisions. And, and then, as we all know, that it can be very useful um, in ending the diagnostic odyssey, especially in genetics. Um, we are used to seeing people who have gone from doctor to doctor um, trying to figure out what's going on. And one of the things I'm struck about when I see patients no matter what they have, whether it's something that's unfortunately pretty common like breast cancer or whether it's a rare disease, humans find a, a, a tangible solace in having a name for something. And I, I, you know, if you can't be around me for long with that, with that figuring out that I think everything comes down to evolution. Um, and, and I think that, you know, figuring out the answers to things has been an extraordinarily successful evolutionary strategy that has, has increased our fitness. And I think that this is just a reflection of that. We value knowledge um, and answers. Um, so I think that that is a, is a tangible benefit. Um, once in a while, you, you strike it rich, right? And, and, and this is the case that I always trot out. By trotting it out, I do not mean to imply to you that this is what's going to normally happen. In fact, this is rare. But i got to show it to you because it does show both the, the potential of making a right diagnosis and it also um, just makes you feel good when you can do this kind of thing. Um, this is a woman who is now 36 years old. At six, she was diagnosed with hereditary spastic paraplegia. She started to have um, both painful contractures of her legs that would occur every day and um, far reduced mobility and function of her legs. So that by the time she was um, a couple years after diagnosis, she was confined to a wheelchair when she had to go very far um, and to two crutches if she didn't have to, to go very far. And there's a picture of her at her first clinic visit with us when we enrolled her in our whole exome sequencing study. And again, she would on, on a daily basis have these painful episodes. So we put her in the whole exome study. She had been worked up at Duke, at a Mayo Clinic, at UNC, and she had just been given this diagnosis of hereditary spastic paraplegia. But we found in her um, a mutation in the GTP cyclohydrolase 1 gene, which, when you look in the literature, confers a condition called 
dopa responsive dystonia, right? And the key there is this dopa responsive part. So we called her neurologist, and her neuro neurologist was very excited that we had something that might be treatable. She put her on dopa, which is a very well tolerated agent um, used primarily for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And this is her when she came back about eight weeks later. She was not using her crutches anymore. She wasn't having painful episodes. I mean, it really changed her life. Now, again, I, I, I show this both because I was very excited about it. I feel like, you know, this like makes the whole project worthwhile. But, but to show that, that um, once in a while, a diagnosis has a dramatic impact, although this is, I would emphasize, um, the, the outlier. Um, more likely and more commonly, this is what we see. Um, this was a 47-year-old woman who um, had a sudden cardiac arrest. She was fortunately um, successfully resuscitated. And on EKG, um, it revealed that, that, that she probably had long QT syndrome, though it can be hard to, to um, diagnose with, with an EKG. Of course, if she had this, it meant very high risk for sudden death. Um, it is also treatable, if you know about it. Um, and the problem is that it, can, that it can be caused by many different genes. So until very recently, we, when we saw somebody clinically in whom we suspected long QT syndrome, there really wasn't a whole lot we could do be, as far as defining the mutation. Um, we were able in her to identify the mutation uh, by sequencing lots of genes. Or we actually sequenced her whole exome, but then only analyzed those genes known to be implicated in long QT. And we were able to therefore guide her treatment and the family members, which is, of course, what she was most interested in. Um, she wanted to know which of her children, if any, were at risk for this, and therefore should be worked up, placed on pharmacologic agents, given an implantable defibrillator, etc. But, you know, we, we have to target the right patients, and, and I, I, I'm not a fan of just indiscriminately applying medical tests to everybody. I think you get into big trouble when you do that. Um, so what are the kinds of patients I think that will benefit? Um, I'm not going to talk about somatic sequencing and the identification of mutations, but I, I throw that in as one line because I do think while I am a cynic about many um, things in medicine, um, I, I think there is a reasonable chance that 10 years from now um, we will really be treating cancer more effectively um, in a substantial number of cases because of the ability to characterize the, the driver mutations. Um, but for germline analysis, I think it's going to be most valuable in a, you know, a discrete set of, of presentations. People with genetically heterogeneous conditions, things like long QT, dilated cardiomyopathy that, that can be caused by lots of genes uh, mutated. Um, enigmatic conditions that, in which there are other clues to suggest a, a primary genetic etiology, those with a family history, right? I mean, a strong family history. I'm not talking about aunt had multiple sclerosis, right? I'm talking about Mendelian types of patterns. I think we also do have to keep in mind something geneticists often forget, which is that, that we do share more than just our genes, right? So just because something looks like it runs in a family doesn't mean it's genetic, but it certainly can be a clue. I, I have high hopes that, that the investigation of children with birth defects will um, be, you know, I use this word somewhat cautiously, but revolutionized by, um, by our ability to sequence. And I, I say that partly out of wishful thinking because I'm a horrible dysmorphologist. I think dysmorphology is, is, a, is an art that I don't really have. Um, so I'm ho I, I want an easy answer. But, but I, I actually think there's reason to be optimistic for, for one simple reason. And that is, there are very few things that are more genetically determined than the fact that you turned into a human, right, on the, with the same general body plan as everybody else in this room. If you had had a bat genome, you would have turned into a bat. Right? So when we see people <laughs> just missed. So, so when we see people with with um, 
disruptions to their morphologic development, I think that in a substantial number of cases we will be able to shed light on it through its sequencing. I think there's some real interesting nuances that might explain why it's not turning out quite as uh, robust as, as some of us hope, but that's a, another story. Um, I, for whatever reasons, there are you know there are a whole group of disorders that that share certain characteristics that that um, implicate the mitochondria, and there it seems to be a disproportionate number of phenotypes that are neurological that that share an underlying genetic lesion, and I think those will be a rich source of of. Um, patients in which we may be able to help them through such analysis. And then unusual presentations like, you know, breast cancer at 25 starts to make you think that, that there's something going on genetically. But what I really want to get across is that I think that massively parallel sequencing of either entire genomes or genome panels, or excuse me, gene panels, will, will benefit a subset of patients. I don't think it's realistic or, or sensical to think it's going to help most people. And I think that we should apply it like other tests. So when somebody comes in with a headache, we don't get a whole body MRI. Right. Um, in fact, when somebody comes in without a headache, we don't get an MRI at all. Right. If it's they have a sore throat. Um, likewise, I'm a little mystified by the idea that we should just be like going nuts and doing whole genome sequencing on everybody. Um, what I'd like to talk about in the, the the next part of the talk, though, is is how we might be able to apply this in in healthy people. And I would submit to you, and I'm not a public health person, right? so I think I can say this, um, and this was a discouraging realization for me when I was early on in practice, but I think it's true. The most significant gains in medicine have been because of public health. They haven't been because we you know, treat this person or that person for a disease. And, and the, the success has been dramatic, right? You can benefit millions. It's a lot better to prevent than to cure. And the historic examples are, are quite compelling. I, when I, I, I like cemeteries, OK? And, and I, in North Carolina, there are these great old cemeteries. And it's heartbreaking, because you see lots and lots of these little miniature headstones, right? And you don't see that much anymore. And you see them often paired with, with women of childbearing age, right? But the reason we don't see droves of children dying from you know, whooping cough anymore is because of vaccinations. Um, I'd say a major advance in public health is fluoridated water. All you have to do is go to a country where they don't have fluoridated water and dental hygiene, and you can see how much suffering that causes. Um, newborn screening is a wonderful example of a, of a public health intervention. But there are a lot of challenges, right? So I know that this is an LC group, right? So, so we really, I promise, there are some LC issues here. Um, that, that, and I think a lot of these get magnified as we begin to approach applications in public health. And, and that's because, in my mind, while I can do patients a lot of harm, I feel like I'm, I can do people who aren't patients even more harm. And we have to be especially careful as we, we and, and we have to be especially careful to eschew you know, hubris and the idea that we know what we're doing when we're dealing with the healthy population. This is the world's happiest colonoscopy patient. That's Katie, correct? Um, but you know, when, when you think about our, our recommendations, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do colorectal cancer screening. I actually think it's one of the most um, evidence-backed public health interventions that we do. But nevertheless, when you recommend that everybody over 50 get a colonoscopy every five to 10 years, you, you are um, kind of often skirting the reality that that individual is very unlikely to benefit. You have to do about 400 colonoscopies to, to actually add any significant amount of time to a person's life. So it means 399 of them got it, and, and they had to all go through that prep, which isn't very pleasant. And they took the risk of colonic perforation, excessive bleeding, et cetera. So I, I guess I feel that healthy people have less to gain than sick people. I used to say um, healthy people have more to lose, but that's somebody called me out on that, and I think this is a more um, a, a, a better characterization. Um, there's a different relationship between the provider and the recipient. People come to me in clinic because they are seeking an answer. They've kind of bought into the healthcare system. But when I spring something on 
a healthy 53 year old that I'm seeing for a general checkup and say, ah, you know, we need to check your cholesterol, we need to, you know, arrange for colorectal cancer screening, we need to get you your mammograms, have you had a pap smear, right? That, they didn't necessarily come to me with those questions, um, and, and it's a different relationship. The benefits are far less obvious, right? Because the big success is, you know, you didn't get sick, which is not very dramatic. Right. Whereas, you know, like that lady who came in with, with you know, dopa responsive dystonia, we were able to, her success is much more visceral. And the downsides are really easy to see in all interventions of downsides. You know, when we, when we do colonoscopy, we're going to perforate some people's colons. We're going to kill some people, right? And when we do tests, you can say, oh, it's a, it's a non-invasive test, but the reality is that, that it leads to downstream things which ultimately become invasive and you hurt people. Right? We also apply these things in mass so everybody has a say. And that can be a distressing thing because people have a say who really don't know anything, right? Like people who, who don't feel like we should be vaccinating our children. Okay, and I would submit that they are simply wrong. Um, and yet, they have a say. Um, everybody has a say. Um, and they also can sometimes have some, some very um, pronounced pulpits from which to speak, right, if they're celebrities, etc. cetera. Um, so I think policy issues become much, much more difficult. And, and that leads me to one central conclusion about, about implementing things in public health. And that is that the ratio of benefit to harm must be really, really high. Um, it, it has to be reasonable in the case of the patient, right, who's coming in to you sick. But, but it has to be really high in public health. So, so what are the right nails then? And, and I think we've focused on the wrong thing in public health um, up until now. Um, the hope has been, and this is kind of the easy thing to throw out there, that, well, you know, with GWAS identified risk SNPs, we can refine a person's um, risk of things like coronary artery disease and diabetes and cancer. And, and that's seductive because even small progress in, in preventing um, such common diseases could have big implications. So that would be great. The hope has been, though, that I mean, we have to have more than just risk tweaking. We have to be able to interfere in a productive way. And I think that's where things have failed. Um, we so far have not found ways in which to use this characterization of common diseases in a productive way to really have a big impact on disease. Now, I think there's a number of reasons for that. One is that that common diseases have a lot of etiologic components, right? So think about cardiovascular disease. You got diabetes and exercise and hypertension and so on. All these things contribute to the risk, your risk of cardiovascular disease. And genetics is just one more component. I mean, we like thinking about it because we're all involved in genetics, but, but it's frankly a fairly minor component of, of those disorders. It therefore places an inherent ceiling on how useful I would submit any genetic analysis is going to be. Um, in addition, the, the predictive power is feeble, right? So you look at a bunch of, well, I mean, these are statistically real. These are not, these are not fake. Um, but the, the relative risk um, for most identified risk polymorphisms is, is modest. It's one to two. And I don't know what to do with that information. Somebody comes to me and says, you know, we, the, a test has been done, and I'm at a 1.3 relative risk for prostate cancer. I have no idea what to do with that as a, as a clinician. And, and you need really robust odds ratios in order to tease out the population. So in the public health sphere, too, um, it's not, it isn't very optimistic to think that we're going to be able to meaningfully separate people into high and low risk. Um, and, you know, the, the facile hope is always, oh, well, if we tell somebody about their risk, they'll alter their behavior. And I think if, you know, for any of us who have sat across from people and, and tried to get them to quit smoking or go to the gym or whatever, 
changing human behavior is really hard, and it's no surprise that, that the data don't suggest that, that supplying somebody with genetic information is a magic bullet. If it was, that could be a problem, right? Because I can t guarantee you arithmetically that for every person that I find who is at elevated risk, if this is really potent information to get them to change their behavior, what about the person on the other end who's guaranteed to have a lower risk, right? Is that going to give them license to you know, eat Doritos and sit on the couch? And so far, combining risk factors hasn't been too useful. It doesn't change the area under the receiving operating characteristic curve um, uh, well at all. Um, although I would mention that I think that when you have an exceptionally high risk, it might be that some of these uh, polymorphisms may help. So for example, there's evidence to suggest that if you have a BRCA1 mutation, characterizing some of your other risk SNPs might be, lead to meaningful reductions or increases in your risk. This is my favorite one, though. And this is the fact that I think that we oftentimes confuse, and if you look in the medical literature, intentionally so, um, relative and absolute <laughs> risk, right? Because especially in cardiology, right, if you can, if you can maximize that figure um, and obfuscate the fact that you're talking about relative risk versus absolute risk, it might get more attention. But the, the simple fact is that I know what we're all going to die of, right? To a first order approximation, everybody in this room is going to die of heart disease or cancer. Now, some of us might get lucky and like get shot, or you know, well, but, but by and large, we're going to get a common disease. That's why they're called common diseases. And I'm just not sure whether it's meaningful um, to nudge the, re the relative risks of something for which our absolute risk is high. Right? So, so even people who are at reduced relative risk for heart disease are actually quite likely to die of heart disease. So, so I'm very skeptical of the idea that, that tweaking relative risks, which is what most of these um, efforts have done, is going to, to really tell us anything very important. So again, this brings me back to my central point. It's the same as, as the other reasoning led me to say, and that is risk assessment is going to be most valuable when the identified risks are high, right? So where does that lead us? And I, I think what that leads us to, in my mind, is that there are some possible exciting applications for genomics in the public health realm. So that's what I want to just, just end in this last part of the talk tell you about. And, and it's derived from the simple observation that, that if you define a handful of conditions um, in which a mutation leads to a very high risk of a preventable disease, the population prevalence for such mutations somewhere around 1%, depending on how you've constructed that list, and that's what we'll get into in a minute. So Lynch syndrome is kind of a poster child for this. In Lynch syndrome, of course, you have a very high risk for colorectal cancer. Risk is about 80%, 85% um, by the age of 70. And one in 400 individuals have such a mutation. That starts to get non-trivial, right? We currently identify those individuals only after either they or their family members have gotten cancer or died. Right? That's, the horse is kind of out of the barn by then. I would like to identify people without the signal being that you know Aunt Gertrude died of colon cancer. Um, making it difficult is that most of these mutations are private. Right? You've got to sequence the whole gene to find those mutations. And that's why, up until recently, it was a fool's errand to think we could do this. But now we can sequence people's genes for you know, not very much money. So I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea that massively parallel sequencing could allow population screening of, and this I really want to underline, carefully selected genes, right? That when mutated could result, result in a high risk of a severe but a preventable disorder. And if you add these up, um, and I'll show you a list that I came up with, um, you're talking about roughly 1% of the population. Well, you know, that's 3 million people. Right, um, carry mutations that predispose to, to similar serious but, prevent but preventable diseases. So I think it's worth asking whether it might go out, might be worthwhile going out and looking for those people. But as you know, I am reminded because I work really closely with with Gail Henderson's group in social medicine. Um, you're going out looking for trouble, right? So do you really want to go out and look for trouble? And I think that's what we have to investigate. <clears throat> 
Um, so I'm not trying to sell this idea as much as I'm trying to sell looking into it and thinking about it. Um, it may seem a little bit contradictory to think about, on one hand, the public health implications of what are admittedly rare diseases, right? Lynch syndrome is a rare disease. Um, but I think that newborn screening shows us how that model can be important, right? Everything we screen for in newborn screening is rare. Um, and yet, when you add them all up, it's a, it's a major public health burden. So I think that if you meet certain conditions, it can be worthwhile. And I think we have to hew very closely to meeting these conditions. And I, I'm frankly disturbed by kind of the creep that we see in screening, right? Because everybody gets their favorite thing, or they get their thing that you know their nephew had, et cetera. And, and I think that can be problematic. Um, you need it to be a serious disease. There's not much point in doing this for the common cold, right? You need a clinically silent latent period. Um, you need detection possible during that latent phase with a good test. And, of course, really critically, you need effective, acceptable interventions. Um, you also need a sufficient prevalence to make it worthwhile. And this we'll get into in a little bit that's, that's kind of tricky, I think. And so this was me wearing one of my ties when I was um, a newborn. Um, and see, I had more hair back then. Um, the, uh, but you know, I think of it as kind of newborn screening for adults. I, I, I think the, may, the time may be right for, for looking into this um, in, in adults. But there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges in this. So, for example, which genes warrant screening? And we have, I don't know if any of you know Deborah Skinner, she's in the group, and, and Deborah's an anthropologist and, and is a, does ethnography, and she records our discussions and our arguments, and they get pretty wild about how to come up with such a list. So I'm not trying to make this sound easy, and I'm also, although I'll show you a semi-quantitative metric, don't mean to imply that this is cut and dried and it's like, you know, just adding up points. Um, we are going to need a better understanding of mutation prevalence and penetrance. And that goes without saying, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but it's very important. We need to set criteria for calling and reporting mutations. I think we have to focus, if we're going to do an idea like this, it's absolutely imperative that we set a very high bar and only pay attention to deleterious mutations. By ignoring other variants, we're going to sacrifice sensitivity, but, but that's necessary because we have to minimize false positives. That's not only true because we can't tolerate a high number of false positives at the population level. It's a horrible test if, you know, one out of ten people are getting a false positive. But we don't even know how to adjudicate variants of uncertain significance. To me, parenthetically, that's the biggest challenge we have in genomic medicine. Um, the fact that, that a substitution of an alanine for a phenylalanine um, at this site in the BRCA1 gene, we just don't have any means of determining whether that's important or not. And therefore, we have to ignore those in the public health setting. We also have problems with accuracy right now in massively parallel sequencing, but I think that's something that is getting taken care of, and there is probably a technological fix to that. Um, one of the things that scared me about embarking on a project like this was that, that the last thing you want to do is find somebody who, oh, we've got good news for you. You've got this mutation. You're at a high risk for a bad disease that could kill you. We know exactly what to do. And, oh, you mean you can't afford to get that done, right? So I'm a big fan of Obamacare. Um, and I think we actually should go far farther than that, but I... <laughs> I'm not in charge, um, and, and, but, but you know, at least we're getting to the point where, where um, people, people will have some access at a, at a greater um, level than they have before. And I think that eventually we have to also consider economic issues, costs, and benefits of screening. And ultimately, we need to demonstrate improved outcomes. We, you know, I mean, giving one line to this in the presence of the people here is, is kind of crazy, but we have to navigate issues with informed consent, right? Um, I do not see this as something that is such a high imperative that, like in newborn screening, we do not 
insist on informed consent, right? Um, that has to meet a very high bar, and I don't think this meets that bar. So I think we do have to let people know what we're doing in the same way that when you go to the doctor, well, hopefully better than when we go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm scheduling you for colonoscopy, right? That's the discussion. Um, we would like people to have a little better understanding of what this testing um, might find and might not find. And is it also gets to the really interesting point that, that, that the same information is seen in very, very different shades by different people, right? So I'll ask you two questions. I love, love asking audiences this. I've asked audiences this from high court judges to third grade students, right? So here are a few genetic diseases highly amenable to prevention. Things like hereditary colon cancer, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So let me just ask for a show of hands. If you carry a mutation that essentially guarantees you will develop a serious condition by age 65 that can be readily prevented if you know other risks, do you wish to be told? So, so who would say yes? I would say yes. Anybody say no? I mean, some people out there will say no, right? Yeah, human beings, you'll find some people answer anyway. But, but yeah, th this is the rationale for why we want to explore this whole idea, because most people are like, yeah, I think I'd want to know that. But here's the other course information we can get. Um, you know, I think even the presence of these diseases has profound theological and philosophical implications, but we don't need to go there. Um, my favorite being fatal familial insomnia, which is just as bad as it sounds. Okay. Um, so these are diseases that, that are caused by specific mutations, very, very highly penetrant. So if you harbor a mutation that essentially guarantees you will develop a severe untreatable neurological disease by age 65. So here, who, who here wants to know that? Okay, Jesus. smattering of hands. Who here doesn't want to know that? Okay, who here just isn't really sure? You know, I, I usually answer, I don't know. I think if there is a right answer, it's, I'm not sure. And the reason I say that is, if you look at the Huntington's literature, and that's where we know something, right, about this, of people who are 50% risk, mom or dad has Huntington's or had Huntington's disease, they know they're 50% risk and they understand the disease, fewer than 20% of those people decide to have the test, which is fascinating, right? And, and somebody asked earlier when we were talking about this, well, what age? are you? And I think that matters a lot. Like, right now, I think maybe, yeah, maybe I'd want to know if five years from now I was absolutely bound to do that. I might, I would probably live my life differently. But um, at 20, I'm not sure if I'd want to know that, right? So anyway, the, the, the bottom line being, as, you know, this is not news to you, the, the, the same inf information is incredibly heterogeneous in the values that we attribute to it, or bring to it. And I would therefore submit that it's, there's little point in looking for such things except on a highly individualized basis. And that targeted analysis of a panel of very carefully selected genes could yield substantial benefits. They wouldn't be these genes, right? They would be the, the prior question genes. And I want to make it really clear that I'm not calling for doing whole genome sequencing of everybody, OK? This is a call to, to look in a highly selected set of genes uh, carefully. Um, I, when, when I hear all of these calls that, you know, well, we should just be doing sequencing on everybody, it reminds me of one of my favorite personal finance aphorisms, which is that, that an elephant for a nickel is only a bargain if you have a nickel and you need an elephant. <laughs> and, and, you know, a whole genome sequencing to me is an elephant that, that even if it's, all of these claims that we should do it, I think are predicated on the naive assumption that it's all about the upfront cost of the test, which seems to me crazy. We also have to think about whether we need that information and the, 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 the deleterious implications of filling the medical record with things we don't know how to interpret that are begging for misinterpretation and misapplication. I think it's fair to say about 97% of us have really boring genomes and we don't understand most of what we find. I think that about 1% of us have useful nuggets of information in our genomes, but the point is we know where to look for those, right? We know what genes those useful nuggets should be, and we don't need to do whole genome sequencing to find them.
So how do we select candidate genes to target? And this is where the ELSI stuff looms very large. This is not just an exercise in, in thinking about the prevalence of mutations. Because as you'll see, we keep coming back to some things that are extraordinarily subjective and therefore difficult. I think you need a transparent process. I think you need to have representatives from a lot of different fields, genetics, public health, general and specialty medicine, <coughs> economics, um, and the public. I think it needs to be an iterative process with ongoing review, right? Because it, it might be that right now, um, for example, presenilin 1 should not be on that list because it causes Alzheimer's and there's nothing we can do about it. If five years from now we have a really effective treatment, which will have side effects, so we are not, aren't just going to give it to everybody and will be expensive, but we have a really good prevention for presenilin 1-induced Alzheimer's, you bet that suddenly becomes a, a, a good candidate. So what we try to do is come up with a, a semi-quantitative metric to score different genes. Um, and, and this is being done in the context of really primarily our U01 CSER um, clinical sequencing exploratory research grant. Um, and and this is one possible scoring strategy. And this is kind of what we've settled on, although I'm not trying to say that there, there are other parameters that are important or that we've even characterized these correctly. But one of the things we think about is the nature of the threat, right? Um, if something is going to kill you at its first indication, that seems like a, a very severe disease. So I'm thinking about something like long QT. Um, if, on the other hand, something like only causes modest or minor morbidity, probably isn't something we want to go looking for in the general population. The likelihood of disease seems to matter, right? We're going out looking for it. We say to Ms. Jones, we found this mutation in you. But if her chance of getting that disease is really, really low, I think it undermines, maybe doesn't, you know, utterly destroy, but undermines the utility of going out and looking for it. Whereas if we find this mutation, and like you're probably going to get this, it matters, right? The efficacy of intervention is like really important, right? If we can't do anything about it, there's no point in going out and looking for it. This is the one that's most subjective and the one we've had the most discussion. I'll use discussion as a euphemism about. Um, and that is what the burden of information, er, of the intervention is. If, and the, 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 the easy way to think about this is, if the intervention is just taking a pill that has like, you know, no side effects and you take it once a week, that's, most of us would agree, yeah, that's pretty acceptable. On the other hand, if for like mutations in the CDH1 gene, the intervention is removing your stomach, a big operation, and then living the rest of your life without a stomach, that's a pretty big deal. And I think mitigates the value of going out and looking. Maybe not destroys it, but it, but it mitigates it. And then if we are going to go out looking for trouble, we better kind of know what we're dealing with. So I think that if we don't have a decent knowledge base about these things, we may not want to go there. So, so if, if you score genes, and what you really should do is, I think, score genotype-phenotype pairs, but think about MSH2 and colon cancer, well, possible death, right? You get diagnosed with cancer and you may die, so that gets a two. The likelihood of disease is a three, and you're quite likely to get colorectal cancer. The efficacy of intervention is, is very, very good. It's colonoscopy on a regular 12 to 18 month basis. And the burden of intervention, we put it at two. Things that, things that require surgery, we would usually put it a one, but you know, we can talk about that. But we're, we call that a two. We, we know quite a lot about this, so it gets a good score. It gets a 13. Just for comparison, BRCA, I think, makes our cut, but it doesn't get quite as good of a score, not because it, it is different in most of those characteristics, but because the, the intervention is different, right? If you're talking about breast cancer, the, the A primary intervention might be risk-reducing mastectomy, which is you know, something that is, is, would be more of a burden. Um, if you're talking about ovarian cancer, it'd be oophorectomy, which again is, is surgery and, and probably get, makes it a little bit lower, but it still scores pretty highly compared to a lot of genes. So here are some top scoring genes, you know, Lynch, RET, um, causing multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. 
Um, fibrillin mutations that, that cause Marfan's and associated phenotypes with aortic dilatation and can cause sudden death of, of aortic rupture. Long QT that we've talked about. I'm interested in hemochromatosis because in, on one hand, hemochromatosis scores very poorly on the penetrance issue. Probably only about 5% of homozygotes for hemochromatosis develop cirrhosis, you know, a bad outcome. On the other hand, it's an unbelievably accepted, it's a, it's a good test and an unbelievably acceptable um, intervention in the sense that you check a ferritin and if the ferritin is high, you, you essentially donate blood. Um, and so it's, it, you know, it balances out to be pretty high. Um, this is, the last one is an interesting one. Um, the ryanodine receptor um, mutations in it cause malignant hyperthermia, and those individuals can have a really bad reaction, a lethal reaction to certain anesthetics, volatile anesthetics. And the chance, how many people here have had general surgery at some point in their life? I mean, most of us, right? And yet, we were not tested for this. It hasn't been possible to test for it. Um, and yet, if we had a mutation in that gene, we'd have a high incidence of having a very bad reaction. So that makes the list, as does perhaps APC. A few further considerations would be the age, right? Um, you might want to think about doing this at different times. If you check adults for RET mutations, for multiple endocrine neoplasia, most of them will have either died from thyroid cancer, it's a particularly bad kind of thyroid cancer, it's not your usual thyroid cancer, or have been picked up because of hypercalcemia. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to do it in adults, but it might make a lot of sense to do it in, in babies or children. Young adulthood, you might think about doing VRCA1 and 2, Lynch syndrome, etc. Middle age, something like um, hemochromatosis. Should there be a prevalence threshold, right? I, you know, about one out of 400 people, if you add up BRCA and Lynch, um, half a percent of people in the U.S. population carries a deleterious mutation. But RET, it's one in 35,000, right? We have to think about the, the use of resources and what our threshold is. Um, there might be differences in ethnicities. Um, and then implementation, I see this potentially as an adjunct to primary care in which we would, um, you know, when it's recommended that you start mammographic screening, say at 40 or 50, um, that might be a time when your doctor would suggest that maybe you should have this suite of genes um, um, sequenced. Um, we have an initial foray into investigating uh, such screening. We call it gene screen, and it's the focus of UNC's um, SEER renewal, and it's directed by Gail Henderson. Um, there are about 20 of us with expertise ranging from medical genetics to ethics and the law. We've got um, really extensive community engagement through a community advisory board that's been a very interesting um, um, activity. And one of the things that I think we're proud of with this, this project is it is the, the sequencing that we're doing is in service to the LC questions. So, so from the start, this was, let's investigate these LC questions by carrying out the sequencing, et cetera, as opposed to what has oftentimes been the norm in, in LC studies, which is to kind of you know, latch on to some, some um, project in which they were doing some intervention like sequencing. So it's exciting to be doing something where the primary questions are, are really driven by the, the LC issues which are to understand you know, how such a program would be accepted, how it would be understood, what the perceptions of people getting screened are, and whether it's feasible. We're, we're recruiting 1,000 people over four years. We're going to be collecting DNA um, from mouth rinses and recruiting through primary care offices in North Carolina, again, to try to ensure that these people have medical resources of, you know, that, that they can get the rest necessary follow-up. Um, we'd like to do recruitment through a website and testing feasibility of that. We want to determine what genes to target, the criteria that are best. I've shown you one possible example. You know, uh, who are the targets for, for this, right? What are the age considerations, access to follow-up of care? We want robust minority representation, how to implement that, et cetera. 
Deborah Skinner is doing an ethnographic study. I think she's having a field day, you know, um, recording us and, and taking notes. You, you kind of forget that you're being recorded. Um, and, and we really want to address both benefits and harms. We're, we're working closely with a um, um, center at UMC whose entire funded mission is to look at the harms of screening and over screening um, because we're not we're not oblivious to the fact that we could be doing harm um, to people and and I like the way some of you know Eric Youngst I think um, Eric had a nice characterization of this he, he said well this sounds kind of like a phase one or two drug study you think that this might be a good idea you think it might help people but you need to investigate what the harms are and all and, and I like that characterization because that's what we're seeing if it's warranted to expand it we're going to need to answer some other questions that this study is just too small to answer um, and we would need you know 10 to 100,000 people I think critically we need to address the prevalence and penetrance of mutations the long-term outcomes do people actually do these interventions that you recommend um, do they you know one of the, the the appeals to this is that every time you identify somebody on average if you look at Lynch you're going to identify three or four family members with this so you kind of amplify your benefit but if people don't tell their family members that doesn't do you much good right and economic considerations are obviously critical and I'll just end with kind of a, a plea for something we need to do right now I think we're wasting a lot of data we have we have huge endeavors out there doing massive amounts of, of sequencing at the same time we don't know what the true penetrance is for any Mendelian condition because we've always ascertained those people by you have the condition and then we go at it kind of backwards right I think that, that the, the penetrance estimates will fall for every disease we have and the new mutation rates will probably rise because again we're not set up to find new mutations who do we sequence people with the family history right so we don't really know the new mutation rate either we need accurate figures and I think we're, we're right now throwing away a lot of data and we could probably effectively bootstrap on existing sequencing efforts and what we need to do is we need to, to create a registry for reporting off-target mutations in critical disease genes. So if you were entered into a study because you had retinal disease, but you find BRCA1 mutation, that's an off-target one. You were not ascertained for breast cancer, so this is legitimate data now that we can use. Um, but in order to make sense of those data, we have to have access to the personal medical history, we have to have access to the family history, and we have to be able to do long-term follow-up. So what I would like to see is a registry and concomitant changes in informed consent for these large studies that would ask people whether they would be willing, if such a you know off-target mutation were found, would they be willing to um, um, give access to this information. Where possible, parental genotypes would be nice, but that's probably reaching too far. And, and finally, I would just say that I, I to me, it's, it's satisfying the idea of kind of coming full circle in medical genetics. We, we've historically been a field that's focused on really rare diseases, and therefore, you know, as a general internist, it's kind of always been a little depressing to me that uh, um, our work is often applicable to only a few. But now we have this new technology where those few can be efficiently um, um, recognized and it makes them relatively common in aggregate, right? We're talking about billions of people in the U.S. who might have such mutations. And, and so I think it's kind of ironic in a nice sense that, that embracing our expertise in rare disease, we could potentially improve the health of, of millions of people. So I would just thank all the patients and the subjects who, you know, they, God, they, you know, they've got busy lives, many of them are sick, and they, they schlep to, to UNC and they let us talk to them and then they go through these interminable surveys on the phone and it's just amazing. And then this is the, you know, cast of, of, of many, of dozens who are involved and then the gene screen um, are, are all these individuals. So um, I will stop there. Have any questions or arguments? Yeah. I was curious about what you see as the role of genetic counseling in this and other future endeavors. Because obviously, if you're going to roll something yeah. out in large public health basis, and 
course, it's a short of genetic counseling. It's not covered right. by you know, a lot of insurance. I mean, you know, well, what's covered. Or so one of the good things, so, so I'm a big booster of genetic counseling. I think that like any field, what we need to do is, is we need to create demand in order to get a bigger supply. Yeah. One of the things that drives me nuts is in genetics, you're always hearing about, we need to push genetics to primary care doctors, and et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that's the case. I think that when we have something use, useful to offer, primary care doctors will embrace it. Right? As genetics proves itself more useful, I think there will be greater demand for, for genetic counselors. And I think they are actually perfectly um, positioned to fill the needs that will be that will 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 arise. I don't think a genetic counselor. This would be crazy. Uh, will will sit down with everybody and talk to them about how this gene screen, you know, might show that people will get a pamphlet or people will, you know, get a cursory explanation that may not be optimal. Um, where genetic counselors will come in, I think, critically important is if you start to do this kind of thing, you're going to identify a lot of people with these mutations, right? They now need to understand both the implications for themselves and their families. Um, genetic counselors, I think, are perfectly adapted to that. But I don't think it's the kind of thing where we need to say, it's the same with medical geneticists. I'm not picking on genetic counselors. I don't think we need more medical geneticists until we need more medical geneticists. Right, and and I'm not a big fan of the market solving things, but I think in this case, the market will solve it. Right, when there's a need, we'll we'll pay for it. And I was just going to mention, there has been a great um, development. I think it was Aetna um, now insists that patients before they have BRCA1 testing um, have genetic counseling, and I think that makes a lot of sense. 